I've got two postcodes this morning that I need to do. So I've got ST1 and ST6. I've got a little app on my phone, and then all I do is I put all the postcodes in, and then it'll basically optimize the route and time which way I need to go. So the first thing I need to do is then just put all these out on the floor and then put them in order, because then it just makes it a lot easier. That's the route I've got planned, so it's only 25 drops today. So start from my place, work all the way through, and then it'll bring me all the way back. Today's an easy one. I really, I should have, I should have picked a bigger job today because Wednesday is one of my easier, day, easier days when I'm only training once a day. But the other days, I'll train in the morning, do a big massive ticket drop, and then train in the evening as well for the, for the boxing. So if you set the order up properly, you haven't got to go through, every time you arrive at an address, you haven't got to go through loads and loads. Baby, don't, 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 <laughs> not today, babe. Well, well, you see, once upon a time, I used to do, I didn't have a method to what I was doing. So I'd be out literally probably eight hours just delivering tickets. But but now I, I do it differently. I do, I do it in postcodes. Al Smith, Al Smith, I do it in postcodes. So it's more, like, say, it's, it's, instead of delivering, let's say, 150 drops in a day, I'll do whatever postcode, whatever the amount's half of them postcodes, Adam Smith, Adam Smith. And then the best name on the list, Joachim Rangberg. What a great name that is. Right, there we go. So, right, they're all sorted now. So, yeah, we can uh, we can go on away now and get start delivering them. Right, come here, right, come here, babe. Right, show, show me, daddy kiss. Oh, oh, hey, can you daddy, can daddy have a kiss? Come going now. Can I have a kiss. You full stop. Come kiss. Whoa! Good girl. Good girl. Yes, sorry, give me kisses now. This is nice. Yeah, let's hear Louise. <laughs> He's hiding. You're hiding, babe. Is mommy, Bob? She and the captain now, Bob. Right, darling. Right. I love you. I'll be about to kiss, kiss. One more kiss. One more kiss. Yeah, come, look at the machine. Come here. Come here. Come here. The old bean to cup coffee machine. So, it's so one thing I treat myself in boxing, and it was this. Because I got this in August 2021, I think it was. So, oh, yeah. August 2021, but then if I go on here. I've saved, I've saved myself some money with this, I'm telling you. So I've had nearly 500 espresso, espressos, nearly 800 espresso longos, I've had nearly 800 Americanos. Yeah, so about, uh, about 2,000 2, coffees, mate. Look. <laughs> That's why I'm buzzing all the time. You think about it, like an average coffee, the, cheap, the cheapest you're going to get is probably £2.70. So I've saved a lot of money. Like, uh, it would have cost me, like, obviously, times 2,000 coffees by 2.7, and you got a bit of money. <laughs> Nothing like spilling your coffee as soon as you go in. Nah, nah, man. Absolutely nah, man. I, I will not this, but... Can't get the weather police can't be driving, drinking this. The first person ever bought a ticket. I can't remember the first ever person. Most likely would have been one of my friends from work when I used to work at the Safford College. Um, but I, I, on my debut, I sold 60 tickets. So there was, um, yeah, there was six people that brought some for, the, for me for my debut, which was, I can't believe it was like five and a half years ago, nearly. Maybe it was five and a half years ago. But yeah, so, but I remember a lot of the people like, um, like Mick Luns, obviously my best mate, Alex Seymour, Ban Banford, and the people from work like Vinny and that. Yeah, I'll tell you what, we'll see something cool that yourself. So if Frank Warren doesn't get me doing a squat quick, Scott Quigg walk on, it'll, uh, it'll be a travesty. Well, I sold 60 tickets on my debut, and then I think my next fights I sold 80 tickets, something like that. No, I think it was the same again, all close. No, I sold 80 tickets, then I sold 80 tickets again on my third fight, and then I think for my fourth fight I sold 120 tickets. And then, then one of my mates was like, oh, you need to get someone else to do that. And I was thinking, Nah, not, not for 120 tickets, you know. So then, and then I think I boxed, my next fight was about 120 tickets again. And then I boxed for the Midlands area title on my seventh fight. And I think about 330 people went to that one. And then it was a great fight. I think you were there for that one. Um, and the atmosphere that was built from that, from that. And, and then the next fight after that, 400 came. And then the fight after that, 775. No, in fact, no, I boxed on BT Sport. 360 went down to, to Birmingham. Then the fight after that, there was 700. Was it Dickett? What was after that? 
But then the Christian Shemri one, I did like 775. But anyway, going back to your points, no, like I, I, just, I'll, 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 I'll thoroughly enjoy doing this. Like it's a, um, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Once you got it set up properly, you know what you're doing. I, I quite like, I quite like doing this because all I'll be doing now is sat at home, probably thinking about the fight. Whereas it gives you a bit of, um, a bit of downtime really, where you focus on something completely different other than boxing. The reason I like doing it as well. People are paying, paying money to watch me fight, and I want to make sure that every single ticket arrives to every single person. Because if anything gets lost, I know exactly what tickets have been lost, so I can get replacements for them and everyone. I don't, it's one of them. People, are, if people are paying to obviously support you and stuff, you need to look after them the best you can, at least in my opinion. I was never going to turn professional, like never, because unfortunately I've seen like over the years some fantastic fights in the city that like turn professional, but because they couldn't sell tickets, they, they sort of just disappeared, like, uh, and just nothing ever really happened, which is a real shame because there've been some fantastic fighters. But me as an amateur, I used to have probably like five people come watch me fight. Me dad would be there, me, me mate Dan would be there. And, and I, so in my opinion, I was like, there's no way I'll be able to make it as a pro unless I win the ABAs and I get signed by Frank Warren. Because you're under the illusion, when you were younger at least, that if you're with Frank, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about selling tickets because you're an ABA champion. But to be an ABA champion is rock hard. Like, it's so hard. So I never achieved being an ABA champion, so I was never going to get signed by Frank. So in my, opinion, in my head, I was thinking, I'm never going to turn pro. So I retired at the age of 26 uh, after 90 fights. My last ever fight was against Zach Parker, who was like WBA number one as a pro. Some lads I'd beaten in the amateurs went on to do really good things the pros like I thought oh, I might not be able to sell tickets but I might regret this especially at the age of 27 when it, which I was at the time I might regret this in three years time to look back and think why didn't I do that so yeah that's turned pro but to go back to the original points once I'd, I'd sold 60 tickets on my debut I thought it's only going to go one way here I've seen the way it goes everyone goes your debut and I only sold 60 tickets, so I was thinking, it normally goes down, downhill after this. So I thought, what's going to, what's going to be 50 tickets next, 40 and then just disappear. But I was dead, I was dead fortunate. Like, I think I was managed really well by Earl Johnson. I had some great fights. My first fight was against Daryl Sharp on my debut. It's Daryl Sharp was, was, I think, six fights before he fought me or something like that. He was a central area champion. So it was a real, like, a real tough test for my debut. And and then my second fight was against a lad called Emmanuel Musinga, um, who was relentless. That's the first time I've ever been nervous in the changing room. It was a four rounder, but I'd missed a couple of runs even there. I don't know why, but I think it's because I was teaching and stuff. I just missed a couple of runs, and then back in my head, I was thinking in the changing room, why have I missed them runs? This lad is, is coming for me. Um, and anyway, I beat him. It's a great, exciting fight, and he, he ended up knocking out. Uh, a local prospect three weeks later but I honestly don't know how to say to someone how, how they can sell more tickets it's funny because when I first ever walked out to Delilah on my debut it was like in this little food hall in Bilston freezing cold it was horrible like, like I said I had 60 people there and oh I need to go right here I'm not concentrating um, I'd, I walked out and I saw her I was like doing something it's dead cringy really. I was like because there was loads of tables, there wasn't much space. It wasn't like there was a stage for me to walk out on, which I did in the future. But I was just going with the music and stuff. And But then my second fight against Emmanuel was a singer. I walked out and I, I, I saw the Kings All stage. Obviously, you've, you've been there. And I thought, I could do something with this. But obviously, at the time, there was like 80 people coming to watch me fight. So I felt a little bit awkward when I was doing this. But I thought to me, off in my head, I was like, one day, if this is goes, goes a little bit bigger, it could look really, really good. And then, and obviously you saw in the fight just before lockdown, it was sold out. And it was the most incredible atmosphere you, you've ever seen. Obviously, like you said about the walkouts, I won't, that went viral. I think they had like three million views or something ridiculous. And, then, and that was what, all of a sudden, I was like, oh my God, look at that. I mean, a lot of people saying, yeah, he got knocked out in the first round when he walked out, <laughs> which would have been quite funny. But fortunately, I didn't get knocked out in the first round. But yeah, it just I think it just captured people's imagination really in terms of it being entertaining. If you can 
entertain people before you've even thrown a punch. I think that's that's a good thing. People just have a great time then. And then obviously entertained by the fights as well. It's pointless having a walk on and, and being entertained beforehand if you can't fight because you're gonna you're gonna meet your meet your match very quickly and then it's just gonna quickly disappear. But no, just I think it's any young fights. It's just just I don't know. Just be careful. Just be like entertaining. Yeah, it's this good old Stoke on Trent Canal. Tell you what. So, take a quick picture. So, I'll take a quick picture, post it through, and then I'll message. I'll message Marie and I'll just say I'll, I'll put it through. Just so she knows she got it. So, but I need to apologise because I accidentally got coffee on a, on a ticket. On the envelope. Um. Yeah, cheers, thank you. Four, eight, four. Oh, I've oh, not closed again. Yeah, it's not good. The red door. Ten. It's a weird one. This is ten, twelve, check, six. Right, that's why. Sixteen. Right. I need that one. So what? We keep your fists at the same time as well. All these running. Yeah, they got the number wrong on the envelope. Don't mind me, son. Don't mind me, son. That's when the dogs come get you. Mate, I'm a dog lover, I am, so even if they come at me, I, I, I'll be stroking them anyway. I think it's when you, you freak out with dogs, that's when they, when they start jumping on you and stuff. So, do you know? Have any horror stories? No, uh, oh, no, I'd say one, one issue is that, the issue, yeah, in fact, no. Yeah, I'll go for a funny one, actually. The last fight. I dropped some tickets. Now, see how I took a picture, just and then sent, and I sent it to the people straight away. Now, the reason I do that is because that's what I used to do all the time. I used to do that all the time, just so it's done. But the last fight, I took a picture, but I didn't send it to the people. I just took the picture. Thought the evidence is there if it comes down to it. And this one lad, Gary, messaged me saying, "Ah, mate, um, I, I, I dropped SC4 tickets yet? Because I've seen that you've done them." I said, "Yeah, mate, I've dropped your tickets." He said, "I haven't got them." So I sent him a picture, he said, that's not my door. What it was, the street, it was just, you thought it was one, one cul-de-sac, but it split up into two. So I dropped the ticket to the wrong door. But anyway, you got the photo evidence. He knocked on, the bloke, the bloke answers the door and says, no, no tickets have been dropped here, mate. And I, so he replied to me, tickets aren't there. I was like, Are you kidding? So I had a knock on, like the next day. And the guy said, yeah, I haven't had no tickets here, mate. I don't know what's happened. I was like, well, the tickets were here. Now, I'm quite a relaxed person, but I got a bit stern with him in terms of, I was like, those tickets either appear tomorrow or you'll be paying for them. In, in, a, in a, the place where I can say, say it. Um, and, and yeah, the, tic, the, the, the tickets didn't turn up, but fair play to the lad. He did phone me up the next day. He said, I'm just gonna have to pay you for the tickets. But fortunately, because I had recorded, the t I managed to work out the ticket numbers. So all I did was, I just phoned up Tony at Frank's and, and just said, listen mate, I need to cancel these particular tickets. And he did, so that I could replace them and he didn't have to pay for the tickets. I got bloke that I was not, I don't think he stole them. I think it, they were just misplaced somehow. But I just said to him, listen mate, you can't, if you've sold them tickets on, just in case you have, they're, they're cancelled. So I just need to make you aware of that. And then, uh, but that was the only horror story from that one really. It wasn't really the horror story, it was just my mistake. And then someone blatantly saying they haven't got tickets when they definitely had. So, yeah, it's one, it's one of them, it's from a very young age I knew my dad suffered with uh, mental health and stuff and potentially taking his own life and that. So I, it, it, for me, it was always a, it was all, always a worry growing up that I'd always probably fight my dad and taking his life one time. 
but it's one of them I think not selfishly but I think I was all 26 years old something like that and I remember coming back home and turned off my dad and I was thinking for some reason in the back of me I was thinking something's happened here something's happened so I went back home because he hadn't answered his phone and stuff and but he was there just sat on the sofa and I was like I can't do this anymore like I can't keep thinking I'm going to come home with my dad's I can't keep worrying about my dad thinking that he's going to take his own life do you know what I mean so I almost like say selfishly thought to myself I've got to stop worrying about this now because it's just not it's not good for me like but obviously I was always there for my dad always but then I think when probably was the next year actually yeah I just I just phoned my dad and, and there was no answer I was at work at the time I was at the college in my mates, it was junior holidays, so I started to go in the office, but I just, my dad had sent me an email, and I just, I just thought, it didn't seem right like that. So I said to my mate, well, I'm gonna go, I need to go quickly. So I went, I didn't tell him where I was going. But then, yeah, I just went to my dad's house, knocked on, no answer. There was no answer on the phone either. And I was just about, I tried to kick the door down, but it was a strong bloody PVC door. Nothing was happening there. And, but, yeah, but then thought to myself, what if I do break this door down and what I think has happened has happened? So I just, I just phoned the police and just and said, listen, don't worry about my dad. And, um, and yeah, then that was, and, and they basically came, broke the window and stuff, went in and then obviously confirmed what, I'd, I'd always worried about to be honest, but yeah, it's him. Um, yeah, you never never forget that kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's, it wasn't the best. It wasn't the best. What it was, it was a, it was an email where he was basically saying, "Can you check this this stuff over? Some stuff that he'd written." And it and he basically just said, "Do you mind checking this over for me? Because I don't trust the person that he was talking about." But but the way he, the way he just. The way it was written, it was just like it was weird. It was just it was just weird. I can't explain it really. It was just I could just feel in the way that he written it, like it was it was the um, it was the end of something. Like he, like uh, yeah, it's a weird. I can't I can't explain it. Mate. It's a it's a it's a weird one. And and we make no mistake, my dad was the greatest dad you could ever wish to, to have. And it's weird because, like I said, I, all, for, for the age of say 13, I knew my dad suffered with wanting to take his life and all this kind of stuff. But prior to that, from the age of zero to 12 or 13, I had the best upbringing you could have ever had. The most happiest one as well. Like, I never knew my dad suffered with anything. He used to come in from work, dead happy. Like, after he probably had an hard day, he was a panel beat on the so it was probably grafting all day and, and, and obviously my mum was great as well it's just yeah so we I think what it was for me is when or my dad once he split up with with my mum that's it then everything just sort of broke down and because he always wanted like the perfect family and so on he, he tried his best you know what I mean but yeah to be fair the next day I was meant I was meant to go Millwall away for one, with one of my mates and and that's why I, I did that I still went Millwall away because but I can't let things like, although it's ridiculous in terms of what had just happened, but I thought you got you got to carry on and stuff. So as I was at Millwall away, I, I actually got a text off Errol Johnson, my manager, saying, you've been um, sanctioned to fight for the Midlands area title. Obviously, he didn't know that my dad had died because I didn't share anything else and stuff. Obviously, my friends at the game knew that I, what had happened and they were amazing. But but I just said, yeah, get it sorted. It's um, I was like, because it was meant to be against a lad called Ryan Aston, who was like a former GB lad, very good lad, Southport. But I was like, yeah, let's get it going. Because I was sort of, in this game, if the opportunities are there, you've got to take them. And obviously, the, uh, the first four weeks of after me dad died, it was very hard. I was, I was on the bikes and stuff. And, and I'd be thinking about me dad and getting upset actually when I was on the bikes. I remember just being, because we had to train at Silverdale, a different gym at the time, instead of our home gym. And I was on the bags, and, and but I think to myself, once the funeral's done, I think I'll be much better because I'll be able to concentrate on what I needed to do. And and to be fair, once once the funeral had happened, the next four weeks were, were great. But I did get I I had a lot of nervous energy on the build-up side fights on the bait on the back of me me dad I think. So there was there was a lot there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on. 
But yeah, but in front of all them people, but all them people were there to back me because they knew what I'd gone through. Do you know what I mean? So it was a great night, and obviously when I when I was when I did win a good close fight, it was it was just mint. I cried, like I got a bit emotional and stuff. But, but yeah, you just have to crack on, don't we? Kind of miss. You can't miss an opportunity in boxing because it's a very short career, and and even and I, I, I like to think I lead by example in terms of um, yeah. I don't let I don't let things get on top. I'm, I'm quite strong mentally. Like, do I have things that? at hard at times of course we all have that but it's, it's how you come through this and stuff and I think I can't get a better example of than when my dad died and obviously winning the title because if I hadn't won that fight because it, it was like voted like one of the top fights in the Midlands the people that went to that fight were probably never gone to the next fight and then it wouldn't it might not never have what, what's happened now with me might never have happened if I'd have let my dad's situation take hold of me which granted it could be he could have easily done that but somehow i managed to get threes and and yeah and now yeah it's um yeah weird it's a weird one it's a bit of a weird mentality i know like because but but i heard this quote once be the strongest man at your father's funeral and it, and i only heard that probably a year after after my dad's funeral and i thought to myself yeah i think i was the strongest man at my dad, father's funeral in terms of I was there for everyone else as well. I've been nice and strong. Yeah, I got emotional at times, but but I like I like to be someone that people can look up to, if you know what I mean. But yeah, so that was an example of that one. But right, I've got to drop this one off to John, number eighteen. Go on, son. Ah, here we go.